As we share some things that have happened during the summer, I always think of this story in John chapter 4 when Jesus is ministering to the Samaritan. Remember that story? And um, the disciples come back over and he says something to the disciples. He says that, don't say that there are four months till the harvest, but the fields are what? He said white and ready for the harvest. And um, when you're reading that story, you read the commentary in Desire of Ages, and it says that as Christ said that the fields are white and ready for harvest, he was looking over a field of unripe grain that was still green. Do you know what he was referring to when he said the fields are white and ready for harvest? It was the people. Because the disciples, when they came to that village of Samaria, they looked at a bunch of people that weren't ready for the harvest, and so they did not go there. But you know, when people are ready, when people are ripe, it doesn't take much effort. You just need to show up, and God does the work. God does the work of ripening the hearts, and all we need to do is show up. Have you guys ever tried to pick an unripe fruit, like an unripe mango from the tree? What do you have to do? You have to tug, you have to pull, you have to twist it. But what happens if it's ripe? It just falls off into your hands. And you know, God does the work of ripening the harvest. And what he calls for is for people to be there to get the ripe fruits when they're ready. And we're going to share testimonies of the way that God has worked in, in, in bringing people into his, um, into his garner. And as you hear these stories, I don't want you to think, man, they're so skilled. Or I wish I could speak like that. Or I wish I was that bold. Or I wish I was that whatever. Because it's not the person that does the work. It's the Holy Spirit that ripens the grain. And when it's ripe, what happens? You touch it and it falls off. God just needs you to be there to catch the ripe fruit. So that's what we've done this summer is we've been there to catch the ripe fruit. And as you hear these stories, I wanted to encourage you to get out there and to make the effort to just be there to catch it when it falls. Don't think that you have to tug and pull and twist and do all the work. You're not doing the work. You just have to be there to catch it. And so I'm going to give the time over to Josh, and um, he'll explain where he was and what they were doing and, and all of that. So I pray that you'll be encouraged and you'll be blessed, and it will inspire you to go out and to, to get some fruit. You know, whenever you, whenever you come up front, whenever I come up front, I'm always trying to find... Um, just the right words to say, but I just want to tell you that this summer, man, the Spirit of God was, was definitely with us, and we were in um, Pearl, Mississippi, and, uh, you know, we were nervous um, about the COVID at first, and as soon as we began canvassing, we saw that people were so open, and they were so thankful that we were coming to their doors. It was almost like People were lonely from the social distancing, and people were opening their doors to us and buying books, and I tell you, I'm, I am not exaggerating that I have never, ever saw anything like I saw this summer. Like, it was, it was ridiculous, for lack of better words. I've never seen so many books go out, so many great controversies. You know, I, I did get the canvas a little bit, and I, I do have a, a, some stories, but I want to just tell you this. You know, after two weeks, we ran out of great controversies. And I started paying attention to how many we were getting out, like 60 great controversies a day. And I, for you canvassers, you know that's a lot for one van. That's a lot for two vans. We got our next shipment of great controversies. And I started paying attention, counting them every day. And there was one week, friends, every day. And I, I'm not talking about books. I'm talking about the great controversy. Every day, 70 to 90. Every day, I began having to put five boxes of GCs in the van. You know, we started setting very high book goals. We were getting 90. I remember 95, and I knew, Lord, <laughs> you could help us reach 100 great controversies. We were having warships from that book. Our training was about that book. <laughs> it was so amazing. And every day we would go out, literally, we could feel the Spirit of God upon us. You know, it's not because we're special. You know, it's really, it's amazing to me that God uses sinful people like us to spread that message. But I want to tell you about one day, we had set a book goal for 100 great controversies. That was our goal, and we were striving for it. And every day during this week, we were, every day, we were, let's reach our book goal, praying to God, pleading with God. That was all of our prayer requests when we were in the van, is let us reach 
our book goal of 100 great controversies. And every day we'd go out, we'd, I remember we got 93. The next day we dropped down, got like 85. The next day, 97. It's like, oh, Lord, I know we're going to do it. I know we're going to do it. The last day of the week, Thursday, our worship was from the great controversy. Our worship was about the great controversy, getting that book out. And we went out. I had six boxes in the van, and I, I thought we'd emptied all of them. At the end of the day, everybody got in. This is the end of the week. Thursday, final, final day, we all get in the van, and we all add up our great controversies. We send our calculator around, and we got out 105. <laughs> But you know what was so powerful is as soon as <clears throat> it's just amazing to see the Lord using us like that. <clears throat> Sorry. But whenever we counted those up and we saw 105 great controversies, we literally felt the power of God, the Spirit of God come upon us in the van. <laughs> Like, we all burst out in singing and praising. I looked in the mirror, and there were people crying in the back seat. And it was just amazing. It was amazing to see the power of God working with sinful people like us. You know, I told all the students, if you get out 100 great controversies, you can throw me in the lake. <laughs> so as we were driving to the lake, crying and praising God and singing hymns, <laughs> We pulled up to the lake, and I agreed to let them throw me in, and they did. They all grabbed me by my legs and my arms and threw me in. Then we threw each other in. It was really fun. <laughs> and, um, but what's, what's, I didn't tell you about the, prior, the week prior to where we went. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this. <laughs> but um, we had an alligator incident. We went to go swimming in the lake, and right as we were about to walk in, there's like a huge alligator swam right up. was looking to eat one of the, the kids that were swimming there. So we didn't go swimming that day, but the next week we did go and talk. Whenever we tossed each other in, we jumped out really quick. So we were thinking about that. But that was the most, imp this summer, like literally, it, it changed my life. Like, and you know what, I, you know what was so powerful? So the camera thing is hard. You sweat, it's hard, but you know, there is joy in serving God. And I, I needed that this summer. I needed that revival in my heart to know that there is joy, joy that you can't find anywhere else. And serving God. And Dylene's going to share a testimony um, from the summer. And then Michael's going to share also. So as Joshua was sharing, um, there was like this real emphasis on getting out the great controversy. And actually the reason why I had chosen to go canvassing this summer was because the Lord really impressed in my heart that, you know, we are living in, you know, the final periods of Earth's history. And it is our job to spread this message that will either save lives or, you know, actually let them know at least what they're doing wrong and give them one last chance. And so when I had, I had pledged to the Lord that I was going to go canvassing, I told him, like, this is the book that I'm going to try to get out. The thing is that um, I was half, like, a little bit into the program, started getting worried that I wouldn't have enough money and I guess for me, always the default is going to the fighting disease with food, shows you the latest information on healthy cooking or whatever. And uh, it's, it's a nice book, everybody likes health, nobody, I mean, if they're gonna tell you no for health, they're probably gonna tell you no for everything else as well. And so for the longest time, it was just probably the book that I got out the most. And, you know, we kept on emphasizing the the fact that we needed to get out great controversies. And I was praying to the Lord and I was like, I want to, but there's this, this fear in me that I just, I can't get rid of. And, and I'm just scared that people will shut me down, but I know that I made a promise. And there was this one week that I kind of like shared a little bit of that with Jace who was mobile one. And he basically gave me this pep talk telling me that it, we saw this guy that was getting out of his car, and he told me, you see that guy? You know, God made a place for him. You know, he's waiting for him in heaven to give his life. And this book will show him the way. But perhaps he'll never make it to heaven if he never gets it. And when he said that, it was just like, man. And I'm over here just trying to make money for school. <laughs> That's not right. And so after that week, I just started like really praying to the Lord and asking him to give me the right words. And this day I came up to this, um, it was the Mississippi, 
uh, what's it called? Well, it was a military branch, anyway. Um, and there were these two gentlemen standing outside. They were a little bit older. And so I came up to them, and I was about to reach for my fighting disease with food, and I was like, no. I just felt really impressed that I shouldn't give it to him. So I, f I pulled out the great controversy, and I handed it to one guy. And then I usually hand out a message book and a health book or a message book and a kid's book. But in this case, I don't know why, the Lord just directed my hand and I handed the other guy the desire of ages. And so I started to canvas them on it and the guy's like, hang on. So who is Jesus to you? He's like, I don't care what you're selling. I don't care, you know, what they tell you to say. Just tell me who is Jesus to you? And I was just like, Lord, give me the words, because <laughs> you know when you have a personal experience with God, but sometimes you can't just put it into words. And so I started praying, and I was like, just, just give me the right words. And it was just so powerful, because obviously I didn't have a speech ready. I had no idea how to really answer the question appropriately. But I felt the Lord just speaking through me and interlacing both of the books into this, you know, testimony. And I actually got to share with them what the Lord had done for me. And by the time I got done, both of these guys had like tears in their eyes. And the guy's like, you know, I've seen people, I've seen Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and none of them, you know, none of them seem to have the experience and reflect the light that you seem to have. You seem to actually believe in this. And if you believe in it, then I want to believe in it too. And the other guy that had the, he, um, the desire of ages told me, he's like, I was thumbing through the book while you were talking. And I've seen millions of devotionals on Jesus and whatnot, but I've never seen anything like this. And so both of them, you know, purchased the books and they actually gave me enough for two other ones. And they told me, listen, give these books to someone else that really wants them you know this message needs to get spread and it was just so powerful that day because you know it helped me realize like so many times and i felt ashamed of myself for this you know i am ashamed of sharing christ because i don't know what the response of people is going to be but people out there they don't want to hear you know, the regular things that they hear from their pastors. They want to see a living testimony. And if you believe it, then they'll believe it too. And that was just like so powerful. And I think that was like one of my days that I had my highest GC because after that I was like, Lord, I'm gonna I'm push this out. And so yeah, it was just a really beautiful experience that really encouraged me and blessed me. I thought I'd share a couple of things more about how the canvassing impacted me than how it impacted the people that I witnessed to. I think it actually impacted me more than it impacted the people that I witnessed to. And so that's why I'm excited about talking about it. But first of all, I wasn't even planning to go canvassing. I wasn't even planning, I wasn't planning to be here for that matter. Every, everything in life, it seems, I wasn't planning for it. it, reminds me of a statement, often our plans fail, that God's plans for us can succeed. So I had to do canvassing for Heartland because I was studying at Heartland and you have to do it for 10 weeks. It was just part of the requirement. So I said, well, let's get it over with. Let's, let's knock it out and let's go to do the program with Watch the Hills because I'd heard a good report about the canvassing programs from Watch the Hills. So I applied and I was accepted and I had a couple very specific requests that God would answer when I attended the canvassing program and each both of those requests were answered providentially so I knew that God was leading and I was really excited and at first the program was really really difficult I'm not gonna lie it was just really really difficult I just felt like quitting over and over again and it was just really, really hard, and books weren't going out, and some of you who canvass, you know how it's like. Um, but every single time that I would be really, really discouraged, and I would think, you know, this, this thing is not really for me. I'm never going to be able to pay my bill by doing this kind of work. I would just really pray that God would give me some kind of divine appointment to show me that this really was what he wanted me to be doing. 
And he would give me those divine appointments again and again. I had so many stories, like five or ten stories, about how the Lord just answered that prayer time and time again. And basically showed me that it's not by feeling that we walk, but it's by faith. And so that was just really, really encouraging. I don't have time to tell all the, the testimonies. Um, but I just wanted to say that canvassing really taught me the importance of staying connected with the Lord. Because when I came to the canvassing program, I was highly disconnected from the Lord, highly non-spiritual. But I left the canvassing program quite a bit different than when I came, and I really thank the Lord for that. It was uh, really a growing experience as, as, you, as you pray and as you beseech the Lord to just help you to do your best. It's just amazing how the Lord answers your prayers. And um, so I can just, I'm just really thankful for this, this kind of work because even though it's really difficult, I just think it's actually the work that we need to be doing for our own character because it actually helps us to grow and revives us spiritually, which is what happened to me. And I was just so impressed with the whole program and just how the, the students from OH and everything and the spirituality that I said, let me just go over and see what it's like in OH. And so that's why I transferred here. So canvassing program brought me here and also God is doing wonderful things in my life. So that's why I'm grateful for the canvassing work. I did not canvass with the OH team. It was actually my plan to do that, either that or do some working with an elder at my church. But God had other things in store, and he had a specific reason for that, among many other reasons. And before I share my testimony, I wanted to read something very quickly from the Desire of Ages, page 480 and 479. It says this, Every soul is as fully known to Jesus as if he were the only one for whom the Savior died. The distress of everyone touches his heart. The cry for aid reaches his ear. And it says this also, Jesus knows us individually and is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows us all by name. He knows the very house in which we live, the name of each occupant. He has at times given directions to his servants to go to a certain street in a certain city to such a house to find one of his sheep. And you know this is a very powerful quote, but what's even more powerful to me is when you get to be that person that Jesus Christ uses to reach someone. And so this summer, God led me clearly to go to Minnesota and I came there the past two summers, so I really wasn't looking forward to going back again. But God led it very clearly, you know, in my devotions and circumstances that that's where he wanted me to go. And so this was one afternoon in Minnesota, and we were in a particular town, Bird Island. And I get dropped off in the street, and this particular territory, not a lot of books were going out. And so I'm just plodding along, being faithful, knocking on the doors, sharing books. People are very quick, very, some of them very rude. But I knock on this one particular house and this lady comes out. She's very nice and very pleasant. And of course, when we meet somebody that's very pleasant, it's a opportunity for a potential devil's rabbit. You know, but as I was talking with her, I was sharing my books with her. And she was interested in some of them, specifically Bible answers, but she didn't have any money. Um, now, we're in Minnesota. She told me that, well, I don't have any money, but you know, I can come back later, or you can come by later, and I'll go to the store or to the bank and get money for you. But after that, you know, we're in Minnesota, and obviously we're all aware of all the things that's been happening as far as protests and rioting with the George Floyd situation, and so she, like many people up there in Minnesota, they were asking my personal opinion about the whole situation. And of course, what I always let them know is that we're in a spiritual warfare, according to Ephesians chapter 6. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. And I was just telling her that the officer that killed George Floyd, I said, you know, I believe personally that he was possessed by a demon. And, you know, if we can see that, 
that people's actions are being controlled often by the devil, it would help us to be more compassionate towards others, and it would also help us as well to be mindful of how we act and behave towards others. And, you know, she was like, you know, wow, I've never seen it like that before. You know, that's a very powerful point. We're, you know, just talking, having a wonderful conversation. But she says this to me, you know, the devil has been attacking my mind of late. And, you know, I've been praying to God about this, you know, and so, you know, eventually I, I, I give her my number, you know, for that, so that when she gets the money, she can call me. And I usually don't do this, but I felt impressed to do it. I just left the book with her, the Bible answers with her. And I finished my territory, and in the same territory, Colton was there with me. We end up meeting. And once I met, we met together, we called our mobile one. And the moment I get into the car, she calls me and she says, hey, I got the money. And so I come back, we come back, and she runs to the car with the $20 in her hand and she's all excited and she's tearing up and she's saying to me, you know, I really want to confess something to you. And she said this to me, you know, you remember when I told you that the devil has been attacking my mind? I was like, yeah. She told me, you know, the devil has been putting racist thoughts in my head. And, you know, she's a young white lady and I'm an African, black, African-American male. And she told me she's only had four experiences with black men in her entire life. Three of them were very horrible. So the first person that she dealt with was a, was a gentleman, African guy, who was interested in her. You know, while she was going to school, he was pursuing her. He was not interested. And so he kept on rejecting her. No, she kept on rejecting him. Finally, he gives up, starts dating another lady, and it turns out he ends up killing her. Second gentleman at the school, you know, just comes up to her and says, you know, I should just rape you. And then later on, sometime later, a third gentleman comes up to her and says, you know, I should kidnap you, bring you back to my country, and sell you as a sex slave. And so she's had these three negative experiences in her life, and because of that, the devil has been putting racist thoughts against her, against black men. Now this was on a Wednesday, and she told me this, that she prayed that specific morning that God would bring a black man to her house that would help her to have a, a positive image of black men. Now here's the interesting thing. I didn't want to come up there to canvas. So in the canvassing group, there was 19 of us, five blacks, two of them were leaders, uh, three black guys, two black women, two of them were leaders, van leaders. I was the only black guy going door to door. And so it's a three van team. We're all going to different cities. And it just so happens that I was in the very van that went to the same city that she was on. And then not only that, I was dropped off on the very same street that she was on. And I got to meet her and I got to minister to her. Um, and it was a very powerful experience, you know. I got to share Galatians chapter three, you know, talking about there's no male or female, black or white, but we're all in Christ Jesus. And, and you know, one thing that I shared with her is this, you know, and she, was, she asked me a question about, you know, how is it, you know, that I can learn to not be racist towards other people or whatever. And I said, you know, well, what helps me to re is this, because the same Jesus that's in a black man or a white woman is the same in all of them. And so when I see somebody that's a Christian, all I see is Jesus Christ. He looks the same. And a few days ago, you know, before I met her, I watched a video by Ivor Myers, The Hidden Agenda of Racism. And, you know, I gave her the link. I sent it to her, you know, to her, her phone, and I told her, Watch this video, it's a very powerful video. Um, and so later on, she sends me a text and she says, you know, thank you so much for the healing. But I responded and I sent her Malachi 4, 2, and I was like, it's not me, but it was Jesus Christ that came with healing in his wings. Yeah. And so that experience right there, amongst other testimonies and amongst other experiences in Minnesota, really showed clearly why God wanted me to go up to Minnesota over and against my own personal desires. And so that shows me whether we realize it or not when we're canvassing, we're being an answer to somebody's prayer, whether it's the person we're talking to 
or somebody that's praying for them, you know? And so we should be mindful to not skip anybody, not skip any houses, you know, because there are many blessings in store. And I look forward to meeting so many people in heaven that we don't even realize we were answering someone's prayer for. And so that was one of my testimonies. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> I am just so thankful that Jesus will use sinners, honestly. I'm just so thankful. Um, so this summer was my first summer with Gulf States. And I actually didn't want to canvas because I didn't want to catch the coronavirus. Um, but God really had a purpose. Um, he made it very clear that that's what I wanted to do. And specifically with Gulf States, I don't even know how Carlos got my number, but he messaged me uh, the day after I decided I'm going to actually canvas and go through with it. And so I ended up going there knowing it was providential. And so um, um, this actual testimony happened closer to the end of our canvassing experience where, um, like around the last week, I kind of had this fire to finish off strong because either two things happen. You get very lethargic and you're like, oh man, it's the last week. Let me like drag my leg and kind of go door to door. But there's like this fire like, whoa, this is just one more week. Let me just push. Let me go door to door. And I actually ran that last week, you guys. Big thing, big thing. So I knocked on this door. I, I end up going to the store, and I see this guy coming, you know, um, very big, you know, soul guy, kind of barbecue kind of guy. And I was like, whoa, like, hi, my name's Elizabeth. You know, I canvas him. He's like, I'm not the homeowner, but the homeowner is going to buy all the books in your bag plus three. I'm like, good deal, you know. And so I go, I knock on the door, and the first glance the guy's like I'm not interested and I was like wait because I don't usually do this I was like but he said that you're gonna buy all my books plus three more and he's like what and so he looks out and he sees his friend with his kids I guess they're having like a sleepover something along those lines and so he's like oh okay you know he greets his friend and I'm just kind of standing there like <laughs> you know and so um, they go inside and I'm still standing there, I'm not leaving. <laughs> and I'm looking at this guy and he's like, all right, so tell me what you're doing. I canvas him. He's like, okay. Um, so um, he's like, what's your profession of faith? I say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And I don't know why I said this last part, but I was like, if you know Ben Carson, um, I'm, I share the same faith as him. So he said, really interesting. And so he's like, have a seat. And I was like, yes. <laughs> I sat down <laughs> and he starts asking me about politics and asks me about um, all the protests that's going on. I gave him my honest opinion on it and then after we were done talking he says, you know, um, what's your name again? I say Elizabeth. He's like, I really enjoyed our conversation but I'm not going to get any books. I said, what? <laughs> I was like, why? <laughs> and uh, he's like, um, Actually, at that point, I, I joked with him. I was like, you know what? Usually, I would joke with people. So I'm very upfront, and I'm like, oh, you can buy all the books in my bag for $100. But I'm really curious, so why don't you want any books? And so he told me, I'm just so done with humanity right now. You know, all that's going on, even the political views, the riots, all this hate, I'm done. I don't want to help anymore. I'm just going to live my life, provide for my family. And that's it. These are very nice houses. I'm sorry. It was like a very rich neighborhood. And so I said, okay, you know what? At that point, I forgot I was canvassing. I dropped my books and I said, you know what? I don't care if you buy any books in my bed, but you listen right now. <laughs> I was like, don't you give up hope? Because you know what? In the Bible, it says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Your heart is so soft and this is hurting you, but you know what, Jesus has a plan for you. Do not give up. And you know, I was just like filling him with Jesus, you know, or trying to, you know. And I was like, no, you know, I'm like, I'm not leaving until you believe in Jesus again, or you know, something along those lines. But um, by the end of it, he paused, and he's like $100. I said, yeah, this is the real deal. Like. I really, you don't need to, but this is the real deal. He said, okay. 
he goes in and he yells to his wife, bring me a hundred dollars. And she's like, no. <laughs> He's like, yes, <laughs> no, yes. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she comes out, he just sits down, he comes out and with a hundred dollars, he gets all my books. I prayed for James that day after I was done praying with him, um, his face, he was just very stoic, very indifferent, didn't really care, but I know he received Jesus that day. And so I'm so thankful for that opportunity that God impressed um, us, all of us canvassers, to go out and make a difference in the corona time. Yeah. So I, so I didn't get to go canvassing, um, but the Lord presented another opportunity for me and my friend Davon, he attends here too. Um, we got to go Bible working, which is a great opportunity to meet people. Um, you're more interactive with them too because you're inside their homes, you're talking to them, you get to know them, spend time with them. But I wanna share, share with you guys a Bible verse from Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So I want you guys to remember that verse while I'm telling you uh, this testimony, or these two testimonies, the amazing thing that God has done in the summer, what stood out to me. So at the beginning of June, me and Devon were me and Devon were praying for Bible study contacts because the church we were attending, it was like a barren field. We had to really put in some work this summer. So we had a list of contacts, and some were had address, some had numbers. We picked this one place. Um, I booked it. We got into the car, booked it, went to the destination. Um, we have no clue who this person is. We have no former knowledge. And I live in that town. The place I'm Bible working is the home I live in. So um, I know the area. So I'm just wondering, like, how am I going to uh, talk to this person? How am I and Devon going to start a relationship? So we knock on the door. And a middle-aged gentleman comes to the door. First, it has a ring. And I see the ring, and I was about to press the ring button. I was like, you know what, let me do the canvassing thing and knock on the door. And he comes to the door, and we start a conversation. In fact, we actually ask for um, John or James or something like that. Um, some, some guy, some, and he was like, that person doesn't live here. And we are like, what? Oh, okay. So. Um, we just tell them what we're doing and we're just looking for people to share the gospel with and we just start a conversation and come to find out to cut it short we found out that he was a Sabbath keeper and that was crazy right so we found out that he his whole family is a Sabbath keeper and in fact his family has started a small church and go they attend church on Sabbath they're not Adventists but they keep the Sabbath and their testimony, how they became Sabbath keepers, is basically the grandma met an Adventist, the Adventist shared um, the Sabbath with them. So growing up, he always kept the Sabbath as a young boy and still keeps the Sabbath as a middle-aged man. And it was just amazing and that we didn't get to have a Bible study with him, but we got to share with him the great controversy. He was excited about that book, but we did get to have Bible study with his 11-year-old son. Not with him or his wife, but his son. So throughout the whole summer, the next nine weeks, we're just having studies with his son. Midway through the studies, um, the little boy's sisters come along and they were autistic. So that was kind of a challenge. But I believe that the Lord gave us that challenge so that we can slow things down, alter. And um, as time progressed, um, the 11 year old boy, his name was Jivan, he became interested in spiritual things. And as we were sharing, me and Devon were sharing um, with the child, or Devon and I, uh, the father was listening. He could hear everything. He was right next in the room. So he's listening on everything we're talking about the great controversy, the truth about the Bible, God's love. And we were able to just create this good relationship with the family and um, Devon and I. And it was just amazing come to find out he was a pastor of his church in fact and he was just amazed that we were doing this work out in corona that's one story that was amazing that you know god showed the second thing is in july our church had a prophecy seminar the church we were working at had a prophecy seminar in the gym but we didn't have service in the church which i thought that was 
that wasn't smart. Um, not having the prophecy seminar, but that doesn't make sense how you have a prophecy seminar with random guests but not have church. But anyway, um, so we have a prophecy seminar and in in June, me and Davon are sharing tracks, getting ready for the prophecy seminar in July. And I'm thinking, man, I wonder how many people are going to show up. I wonder how many people are going to show up. There's probably not going to be a lot of people there. It's probably going to be more Adventists than our non-Adventists. Probably like five guests. You know, it's Corona. Anyway, July 3rd comes around. The first night, it was a Friday night, I believe. 56 guests show up. Five, non, five Adventists. So 56 non-Adventists, five Adventists. I'm like, okay, so, you know, that's just the first night, though. You know, numbers are going to drop. Probably going to be, what, 10 left, you know? And we're sure to have more Adventists the next night. And for the next consisting week and a half, about 30, 31 on average, non-Adventists. And... Um, still barely any Adventists. The seminar continues throughout the whole of July. People are convicted. They hear about the Sabbath. Like we have that consistent number up until the point of them talking about, I think, uh, yeah, the mark, yeah, the mark of the beast. Now they heard the Sabbath. They, uh, 30 people, 35 people heard the Sabbath truth and they stayed and they came for the mark of the beast and they heard it and then the numbers dropped, but they were consistent for a while, so a lot of people had seeds planted in them. They were interested. They got Bible studies every night. Uh, relationships were formed. A work was truly done. And it was just exceeding and abundantly more than what we could ever ask. We had Bible studies. We had people show up. We had an amazing summer, and I just thank the Lord for it. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you, I am super excited to be here, not because it's Sabbath, but because I am amongst family. Um, but you know, I want to share with you guys three things. I want to share with you guys um, a lie that Satan wants to put in our hearts. Well, actually two lies that Satan wants to put in our, in our minds and our hearts. But I want to share what God is able to do amongst all of those different things if we are willing to listen to him. Amen? Um, you know, the first one is that many times we think that we are not qualified. What do we think we're not? we're not qualified, you know, and it may be true. We may not be preachers. We may not be uh, professional Bible workers. We may not be uh, the best canvassers out there who get like 60 GCs out, right, a day. But guess what? Although that might not be us, that does nowhere in the Bible, can somebody say nowhere in the Bible? Can you guys repeat that? Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does it say that that does not qualify us to be soul winners for God. And I think that that is one of the greatest deceitful lies that Satan will throw at you. Whenever you want to serve him, he says, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord, I can't, I can't serve you because I, I didn't go to Andrews University or to Washington Hills or anything like that. I, I am so sorry, I can't serve you. But you know what? I want you to really remember that the only thing that makes you qualified is you accepting the gift of grace that God has given you. You know, when you truly see that Jesus is enough for you and that he has paid the sins, you know, on the cross for you, for me, then you're ready. He says, oh, I'm, I'm ready to share this. You know, this is such a good news. You get it. You, you're ready to pounce, you know. You're ready. So that's the first lie. What is the first lie? You are not what? Is that a true or is that a lie? Who, who lied? Satan is lying to you. But Jesus wants to tell you, look, you are qualified because I make you qualified. Amen? Now, the second one is that whenever we realize, okay, well, Lord, now that I want to serve you, uh, Lord, where do I serve you? All of these different things, you know, may come into your mind. But you know what? At the end of a beautiful experience, after you decide to give everything to the Lord, after a beautiful summer, you have seen blessing after blessing, guess what Satan wants to tell you? Do you guys have any idea? You didn't have any good experiences, Crystal. You didn't, uh, there was nothing special about what you did. You didn't impact any life. But you know what? 
That is the second biggest lie that Satan wants to tell you. While you're in the canvassing field, while you're, you said, you know, I didn't get a dump bag. Oh, you know what? I, d- I didn't get like, you know, a 2,000 donation, you know, from one person. Oh, I didn't get this. I didn't get that. Or, you know, all of these different things. But you know what? Every door, every interaction that you have with people, every smile, guess what? That is an impact. That is a blessing within itself. And I, I want to remind you guys that Satan will come at you and he will tell you, you know, today wasn't, there was nothing special about today. But you know what? You have to go back into your day and you want to say, Lord, were people able to see Jesus today through me? You know, that is what truly matters. At the end of the day, are you having a relationship with Jesus, right? And can people see that from you? Um, but you know, with the conclusion, not, uh, what was the second lie? What was the second lie? Say that again? Yeah, you didn't have an impact, okay? What was the first lie? You're not qualified. The second lie at the end of the summer, what was the second one? No impact, right? Now those two are what? They're what? Lies. Thank you. They are lies, okay? But you know what I want to really remind you guys is that the Lord gave me such a beautiful summer that it doesn't matter what Satan tells me, that I did have an impact. And I knew this because before even going there, God reminded me of something. And he said this. He said, is this not the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and then you break every yoke. You know, as I was coming to this passage, I said, Lord, that's me. I, I, I'm going, you know. I'm going to break every yoke. But, you know, it's so beautiful because in, in this process, there's many people who have to put hands all on deck. You know, the church has to put its part. Bible workers have to put their part. Church members have to put their part. You have to put your part during the summer. And, you know, as a Bible worker, I came to the realization that I must do my part. I remember that the, and there was, um, the church has sent out, um, it is written Bible study uh, request forms through mail. And we got so many. It was such a great success. And we're just like, oh, my goodness, we're, we're ready, you know. And we went to go follow them. And me and uh, Judith and I, we went, and we were just so excited meeting people. There was this one particular house. We get there. We knock on the door. This lady comes out. She says, that's not me. Okay, <laughs> Uh, you know, kind of, you know, we asked her, is this you? Are you Miss Carol? Um, can somebody give me a name? Is this Miss Kathy? You know, are you Miss Kathy? And then uh, she says, no, I'm not Miss Kathy. Okay, no problem. You know, usually when we go and we follow up with people and they tell us, oh, this, um, you know, this person doesn't live here. Usually it's like, oh, they probably moved, then you walk away, right? But guess what? The Lord was impressing us. The Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. She's somewhere around here, so start searching, you know? So we went to the next house, to the neighbor's house. Hey, um, you know, does a Kathy exist here, you know? And does she live here? Uh, No, but she lives right there. And it was right across. We would have never gotten to her unless we went to the other door. So... Um, later on, we, we crossed over the street. We met um, this beautiful lady, uh, Miss Kathy. Um, and as we were speaking to her, you know, very sweet lady, we told her, you know, we're here to offer free Bible studies that you requested. And she said, oh, okay, nice. My husband's sick, so I don't think I will be able to follow through. Kind of saying, like, thank you, but no thank you. That's it. And, you know, it could be in our thoughts that usually people like that, they say, oh, you're, we're not interested. Um, and we may tend to put them in the back burner. But guess what? Jesus does not put people in the back burner. He puts them in the oven. And it's like, what? Yes, he puts them in the oven. You know why? Because he heats them up with love. And that is Christ's method alone. Let me remind you of it. Something so amazing about this is that the only method that will give true success is that method that says, mm, this is so beautiful. It says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. 
the Savior mingled with people as one who desired their? They're good, that's right. He showed sympathy, sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he invited them, follow me. You know, with this lady, you know, although her husband was sick and we were not able to go and give her proper Bible studies, we did not stop visiting her. Whenever we would um, pass by that neighborhood, hey, let's go uh, visit Miss uh, Kathy, you know, we would go. One time we went, we just passed by to drop off strawberries to her. We said, hey, we j we're on the go, but we remembered you, and we wanted to drop off some strawberries. Enjoy them. And she was just so thrilled, so happy. And, um, you know, another time we came by and we said, hey, we, we just came by from somewhere, but we, we have our guitar in the car. Can we sing you a song? And she's like, oh, yes, sure, sure. Wow, what a surprise. We sang to her. Other time, we just came to, to um, you know, to speak to her, different things like that. We would come and pray with her. And, you know, by the end of the day, our very last day, we came and it was trying to transition people to the church members. We brought a church member. And this person that seems like then had not received Bible studies, but just the simple fact that we were meeting her needs was something so amazing that was just prone to bloom. And, you know, as we brought this uh, church member, uh, we were, you know, telling her, we gave her uh, a picture of ourselves that we had taken prior to, be, um, you know, one of our, bi um, you know, visits with her. And she was like, wow, I will never uh, forget you and different things like that. And we said, hey, look, this is uh, Miss Mary, you know, although we're leaving, we just want you to know that somebody's here for you in difficult times. And as we did that, she said, oh, wow, okay, yeah, guess what? Those family members, the, the, um, the father who, or her husband, was the one that was sick, right, and was going through chemotherapy. That's why we weren't able to give Bible studies to her or, you know, go any further than that. Um, he said, hey, do you know so-and-so? And he says, oh, yeah, I'm related to them. Long story short, they knew each other even before they had even met. So, you know, and right there and then they exchanged phone number. They said, oh, yeah, come on over. I'll be expecting you. And it's just so beautiful because although we did not get to study the Bible, because we ministered to her needs, people were willing. She was willing to receive that other person into her life so that, you know, something can actually happen. So don't put people in the back burner, okay? Put them in the oven and love them all you got. All right. All right, well, um, having said that, let us go to our knees as far as possible. If not, just bow your head and let us say a word of prayer to thank the Lord what he has done for us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful to know that you're a God who loves us be beyond what we are capable of doing beyond all of our qualifications. But Father, we, we are just so thankful that we have such a loving God that is willing to share His love with us by giving us beautiful experiences, not only out on the field or, you know, in different states, but even here in Washington, Lord, You are willing to give us beautiful experiences because You want to dwell among us and You want you want us to see each other in one another, Father. And we just want to ask that these experiences may not end during the summer, but that they may be continually happening in our lives. That day by day, we may remember that, Father, you are enough for us. And that we may remember that we can ask for divine appointments even while we're in school. That maybe even ministering to staff, ministering staff to students, vice versa, Father, ministering to one another is one of our greatest needs today. Father, that we may show sympathy and compassion towards one another. Father, help us to reflect your character day by day, moment by moment. But above all, give us your Holy Spirit so that we may do it effectively. Because Lord, who better than you can, can make yourself you in our lives, Father. Thank you so much for being so willing to live in us so that your righteousness may be seen. We thank you, Lord, and we just want to ask all of this in Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen. 
Thanks for joining us here at Washington Hills College and Academy for our weekend program. We sincerely hope you've been blessed. Also, to keep sharing the good news, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the notification bell before you go so you'll know when we upload the next video. Be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. Have a blessed Sabbath.